Uh, turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, and uh, let's bow our heads and uh, talk with the Lord. Dear Lord God, there would be a trap right now for me to want to pray some profound prayer to say something special or memorable in God the feeling in my heart is I want to say thank you thank you God for the people in this room sisters and brothers God thank you for not giving up on us thank you God for using us and allowing us to serve you in our community. Thank you, God, for the cross and your son, Jesus Christ, bringing all these different kinds of people together at the foot of the cross, all of us united because we all know, like Sister Vicky was saying, that we have filthy sins and that we need, we need what Jesus Christ did for us on that cross. God, thank you that you've united us into one family and brought us together. Thank you for Sunday mornings when we can get out of bed and, and go and sing your praises and pray and be with your people. Thank you for your Bible that we can study week after week, day after day, for, for our lives, a, like a love letter from you, God, from your heart to ours. God, thank you that you don't give up on your children. And Lord, it uh, came to me that I'm very thankful for potlucks and all the good food that we have together. Thank you, God, for, for all of these things and so much more. I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, Joshua uh, 4, 19 through 24. So Joshua is leading the, uh, the people of Israel into the promised land. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones that they had taken out of the Jordan River. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And uh, sometimes in life we need to set up a marker the way uh, Joshua did. He set up those stones. He made, a, he made a memorial, and he said, now, your kids are going to ask you, and in our context, maybe kids will say, why do we go to church? What's this whole church thing about? Why is God so special to us? Set up a memorial and, and then speak and remind people, look what God has done. Look what God has done, and it's good for us to reflect, and that's one of the reasons why John was talking about uh, journaling. It's good to to not just keep praying, but to look back and say, wow, look at all the prayers that God has answered. It's, it's good, and it's important for us to set up markers in our lives and to look back and say, God was there, God was with us. We human beings need moments like this, a memorial. We need to celebrate the things that God does in our lives, a, a wedding ring, to remember, to recall, a diploma, a uh, Sometimes I'm not really big into ceremonies, and, and I, I remember when I was graduating from high school, I, I wanted to skip the ceremony and uh, did not really feel attracted to uh, some sort of ritual like that. But, but mom and dad made me go, and, and they were right, that you need, you need these moments in your lives to look back on. Baptism is one of those kinds of moments. 
Memorials to commemorate brave soldiers. So we can be driving along, we look over there, and it just comes into our mind, there's been a lot of people that have gone through a lot of hardship. In order for us to have the freedoms we have, there are a lot of people laid down their lives for their country. We set up memorials to remember these things. All these things help us to recall these events that are vital and important. Birthdays, wedding anniversaries, they, they're a kind of framework for our lives. The ancient Israelites would set up a stone, a marker, to remember an important event, to recall what God had done for them. The Romans would place a rock every mile along a road to help people keep track of their journey. These would be called milestones. Uh, that's what we're doing here today. We're setting up a stone, marking a milestone, celebrating to bring to mind how God, how faithful that God has been so we can keep track of our journey. Ten years, that might be a pretty large chunk of, that might be a pretty large chunk of your own life. I'm looking back at there. Well, I don't see her right now. My cousin Amanda, and uh, boy, she was small when we started. Well, she's still short. But, I mean, she was young. What I meant to say is she was young when we started the church. When I think about uh, celebrating, and that, that video really helped me. Uh, when I think about celebrating, Ten years of Foundation Bible Church, a lot of things just come into my mind from all over the place. I think about the miracles that we've seen happen again and again, miracles that just take your breath away, and they always make us think, well, why aren't we praying more, and we ought to be praying more, when we see all of the things, the amazing answers to prayer. I think of all the wonderful people. That's, that's big to me. Leaving Japan, coming here, and all the wonderful, wonderful people that God has brought into our lives that we've met, we're family. We're family. When I think about God, how God has brought us all together, it's hard to imagine. And I, and I was talking to, to some of you this week. I said it's hard to imagine we're all here by coincidence. It really feels like God has had his hand in it, that he was drawing us here. I think of the things that God has done in my own life and how I've changed and I feel like I'm not ready to be a pastor at 44, and I really don't know what I was doing at 34. Think of all the changes that have happened in our lives, all the children that have been born since we started. I think about how this is a church we've always said, all hands on deck, every member a minister. You know, Don't just dip your toe in, jump in, be part of what God is doing. Come alongside, serve, share your faith, do the hard work. I love it. This video showed it. All the people who are speaking and serving today showed that once again. I think about how carefully we've gone through the Bible. We've gone through the entire Bible, and we spent years, years going through the Old Testament piece by piece to lay a foundation to understand Jesus Christ in the New Testament. A lot of things come to mind. When I think of 10 years, I think of the great meals that we've had together. That, that's not a funny line. I do. Uh, I, I'm already looking forward to uh, corned beef and cabbage next year. Uh, I look forward to the Thanksgiving feast, the uh, Christmas feast. We eat together at our church sometimes two, three times a week, and, and I love it. It's, it's sharing life together. It's doing life together. What I don't think about, and I knew this early on when I was putting together my ideas for a 10-year celebration, that the biggest idea that was coming to me, the thing that I, I don't think about is that this is a time for a self-congratulatory pat on the back. Far from it. God has done wonderful, amazing, miraculous things these 10 years. The thing that amazes me most about that he did it through messed up people. God has done beautiful things through people like you and I, not because of us. Oftentimes I feel like, wow, look what his God has done in spite of us. Needy, broken, hard-headed. 
I've crashed into a lot of you guys over 10 years. Uh, wish I hadn't. Wish I had always done a better job. Impatient, easily upset, immature. I could go on and on and on and on, but as I was making that list, I realized I don't really, really today want to draw all the attention on my feelings because I'd rather put the attention on the goodness of God. God has been so good to us. And it's so good to be, to, to, to be here and know that we're a part of something God is doing. God, the Holy Spirit, is working, and we get to be a part of it. As Vicki was saying, coming as we are, as messed up as we are, God is working, and we get to be a part of it because he's so loving and so good to us. Today we celebrate not our own strength, but today we celebrate how a good and gracious God can work through regular people. Brothers and sisters, believe it. This church, 10 years, it's a testimony that God can work through regular people and God can do amazing things in your life. And there are people in your life, maybe they're coworkers, maybe they're family that you love and they're living apart from the Lord. Maybe they're neighbors, maybe they're people you grew up with in high school. God can do something wonderful through you. And never think, well, I'm just messed up or I'm just usual or I, I don't know as much as I should. God can use you, and God will use you. Regular people, messed up people, are just willing and available to do heaven's work. And I believe that now even more than I did 10 years ago, and I knew it intellectually 10 years ago. Listen, this is so important. God's not looking for talented people. He's not looking for the smartest people. He's not looking for the most popular people. God is asking, are you available and are you willing do you want me to use you? Because I will. Do you want me to, to, to let? He wants to have his love flow through us to others. And we have to decide whether we're going to turn off that spigot or let it flow. God wants to use you to be a blessing to other people. And I often think of that, Lord, I don't want to be a curse to my wife. I don't want to be a curse to the people around me. I want to be a blessing why would I want to be a curse? Why would I talk like that? Why do I pout? Why do I have you know, all these attitudes that we struggle with? All these attitudes that mirror hell more than heaven. And meanwhile, God is saying, Dan, I just want to flow through you. And we can, we can be a tremendous blessing. We can be a tremendous encouragement to the people around us. We start saying no to our flesh. No to our hard-headedness, our vindictiveness, our pettiness, our pride. Start saying yes to God. God, please, please use me. Please use our church. We want to bless everybody around us. In Matthew 17, 20, that's the passage where Jesus tells us, he says, if you have faith like a little seed, this little tiny mustard seed, he said, if you had faith, just this little bit of faith, you could move mountains. And I think we tend to focus on the mountains. I'm going to... Do great things, all the great things we can do for God. But I've been thinking more and more and more about the first part of that. All we need is a little bit of faith, just a little bit. It doesn't take much. God works with us, not out of our abundance. God works with us in our neediness, in our poverty. Just a little bit of faith. Let's quit focusing on the mountains for a moment. That's good. To, to have vision, to imagine what God can do. But let's imagine, what can God do with just this little faith that I've got? It's not as much as it should be, not as strong as it should be. Jesus said, with just the faith of this tiny little seed, he can accomplish great things in your life. And that's really encouraging to me because I don't have to pretend like I'm all that. I can come before God and say, God, you know I'm not much. God, you know... You know all the stuff in my heart and in my mind. God, you know. You know. And Lord, your word says that you'll love me and accept me and make me a child. And I look at the cross and you died for my sin. I believe you. And Lord, if you're willing to use somebody that struggles and is messed up, I want to be used. Please, God, please show your love to people through me. Please bring your truth 
through us. And God can use you. This little tiny church shows us what God can do through willing people, available people. It's really encouraging to me that we have a good, good God. And God, sometimes we think God is so angry and so stern. And I want you to think, look, do you notice we have got a lot of beautiful children in our church? Amen, right? When those children, hey, I heard it, amen. When those kids are learning to walk, when they're learning to talk, are you just angry because they can't do it any better? Or you just celebrate every step, every, celebrate every word that only mama can understand and nobody else. Everybody else is pretty sure they ain't talking, but mama believes it. God looks down from heaven and sees our little, bit, our little baby steps, and he, and he hears us learning to talk, and God is pleased. I believe that God is pleased with what we're doing here. It's not perfect. We stumble. We mess up. We take wrong turns. I believe that God is pleased with us when we come to him in faith. Sometimes all we need to do to please God is start. I don't know if I'm going to be great at prayer. Start. I don't know if I can share what Jesus means to me with other people. Just get up and do it. Start. I want to read my Bible, but I'm not sure I'll stick with it a whole year. Just start. God is pleased when we start. Zechariah 4.10 says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Isn't that beautiful? It's small. It's not all it should be. There's not a lot of strength there, not a lot of wisdom there all the time. But God says, you're starting and God is so pleased. God in heaven who made this entire universe rejoices when you and I say, you know what, from this day, I'm going to start living for Jesus. I want my life to count for something. And God says, I don't despise small beginnings. The Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. Remember Zerubbabel's the guy who came back and saw all the rubble on the ground, so he wanted to build, up, <laughs> build it all back up. The plumb line, you're just starting off. We're going to measure it out. When we started foundation, it was pretty small. It's still pretty small. But isn't it neat to think that God was pleased with the work we began 10 years ago when we picked up the plumb line and we said, okay, let's get to work. Who's in? It makes me excited to think what work God may have in store for our church in the next 10 years if the Lord uh, tarries God willing and we remain humble and obedient, and faithful, and open, and willing. When I think of the lessons I've learned, again, there's just too many, but I, I wrote down just a few, a few that would just jump, the few that just jumped into my mind. What are the lessons I've learned over the last 10 years? Number one, I've already been speaking about this, I learned I am inadequate for the task. Uh, it's scary. The responsibilities are so huge. I never was adequate. I knew that. I know it better now. I'm still not. I used to kick myself around a lot. Uh, foundation deserves a better pastor. And uh, I've been praying, God, give Foundation a better pastor than me. Uh, and if it's possible, Lord, please let that pastor be me. Uh, make me, make me better. My wife deserves a better husband, but I don't pray that she gets a different husband. Uh, my wife deserves better. She's a daughter of the king. I want to be that better husband for her. Uh, my kids deserve a better dad. But you know, I love this church. I'm glad I came. I love my wife. I love my kids. I'm crazy about them. I love the Lord, not as much as I should. I, I even feel self-conscious saying I love the Lord because he knows. But you know what? He's responding. He, see, he sees that love, he's a, and he knows it could be a lot better, <laughs> a lot deeper. And God doesn't sit around waiting for perfect people to do his will. No such thing as a perfect church. 
God's not waiting for you to be perfect before he can use you to be a blessing to somebody. Did you hear me? If you wait to be perfect before you start loving people and blessing people, you're going to be dead. God's not waiting for perfect people. Again, in this church just speaks to it. The existence of this church, God, is, God uses willing people, available people. Second, we're not here to do impressive, flashy things or to build earthly kingdoms. We're here for two very simple things. And don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. We're here to love God with everything inside of us. And we're here to love one another. Everything else is fluff. Everything else is missing it. There is no thing as spiritual maturity without love. And then you say, well, love is big and spiritual. It's more than a mere affection. Absolutely. That is not less than affection. And don't start talking about how much we love God if we don't have warm affection for our brothers and sisters. Love God. God, anything that's inside my heart, God, anything inside of our hearts this morning that's keeping us from loving you, please tear it down and throw it away. It's all worthless. And Lord God, help us to really, really love one another. Be quick to forgive and slow to anger. Help us to be very patient, very kind. Help us not to be critical or judgmental, Lord, but look to encourage and strengthen and build up. And Lord God, there are many people that don't know your son Jesus. They have an image of Christianity, an image of church that's just not true. Lord God, help us to show you as you really are. Help us to be patient when people say nasty things about the church because they don't know you, Lord. And help us just to pour on grace and love. Lord God, we want to love you and we want to love others and we don't want to miss the boat. Amen. So we're not here to do big things. We're here to do simple things, loving God and loving one another. Again, there's no spiritual maturity without love. Next point, as a church, and you just heard it in my prayer for the lost, we need to be outward looking. There's a temptation with churches that the older we get, the more inward we become a holy huddle. Let's just love each other, and, and boy, we don't want new people because they're different, and they don't understand the way we're doing things. And uh, I haven't seen that yet in our church, and I really, really do not want to see that in our church. Our job is to do everything we can to reach this world with the message of Jesus Christ. We need to be hungry for souls, and I challenge each person in here, pray, Lord, make me hungry for souls. I want to be desperate, desperate to see people baptized, desperate to see people saved, desperate for people to come and say, Lord, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Let me be part of your family. I want to be desperate to see that happen in as many people as possible. If we lose our desire to share the message of the cross with a world that's on its way to hell, we need to turn in our church card because we're just a supper club. And I'm not going to come. I'm not, I'm not going to come to a church that doesn't care about the lost anymore. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter if we never become large. What matters is faithfulness. We need to be committed to calling people to repentance. The cross says, you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. That's why we need the cross. We need to call people to repent so they can enter into a right relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, it's good for you and I as well to be humble enough to share our faith. The world says, thou shalt not talk about religion. And Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. And I need to choose who's going to call the shots in my life. We need to love people, and we need to love our Lord enough to share what the cross is all about. Amen. Lastly, this has really hit home to me is uh, how fast life goes. And I was thinking about the people, the funerals I've done. Uh, too many, but the odds are the next 10 years are going to have more. Uh, 10 years, on one hand, doesn't seem all that long until I realize, boy, it's almost a, coming up on a quarter of my life I've been here. I was only 34 when we started the church. Megumi 
was about this tall. Chia was this tall. Aiko was about, uh, well, she was crawling, I think. Uh, they look so small in these pictures and these videos. It's possible. It's possible that my girls could be married in the next 10 years. My dad has changed. Um, how shall I put this? <laughs> he took up less of the frame when pictures were taken. <laughs> Before I started foundation, I prayed and I spoke with a lot of people, including my grandpa, who was a pastor. You saw him in the video on several occasions. And, and, and John Swanson, Pastor John from River Hills who just passed away this week. Neither one of them are, are with us today. If Christ doesn't come back soon, who's going to be with us to celebrate our 20th anniversary? And who won't be? And what are we going to do with our lives between now and then? Only one life soon tuned past. What's only, only what's done for Christ will last. Time is short. The days are short. Our money is short. Our influence is short. Let's spend our lives and our resources to reach out for the kingdom of God. Let's be winning people and bringing people into the family of Christ. Psalm 90.12 says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalm 39.4, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is so that I can use my life wisely. When you're counting your days and you're keeping track of how bad, how quick life goes, I guarantee you, you're not going to spend much time pouting about your church, things you don't like. You're not going to spend much time grousing about your husband or your wife. Why waste that time angry with a brother or sister? What a waste of life. God's given us a life and it's passing quickly. We think, we think, someday I'm going to share my faith with people. Why wait? We don't know when that someday is going to come. Jesus Christ loves everybody in the world. The cross, on the cross, Jesus died so that we could go to heaven and have etern eternal life and salvation, forgiveness of sins, that we could celebrate in heaven. Why wait? Start sharing our faith right now. Here's the take home. Let's live our lives wisely. Let's keep in mind that God doesn't need the smartest people. God doesn't need the most talented people. He's got all the power. He's got all the wisdom. God's looking for faithful people. And where can your life be in 10 years if we start giving more and more of our lives over to Jesus Christ? And what can he do through us? And who's going to get saved? And their eternal destiny changed from hell to heaven because you and I decide to be faithful with our walk with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for these 10 years. We look forward to what you can do in each and every one of us. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to be loving. Help us to put you first. And Lord God, we want to say, here we are. Here we are, God. We hear your call, and we're right here this morning. God, use us to make a difference in other people's lives. Please, Lord God, Use this church, Lord God. Please use this church to reach Janesville. Lord, please use this church to reach the world with the message that you love us and that you will forgive us when we come to you in faith. Lord God, help us to love you with everything we have and to love one another, we pray. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.